Are we live? Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Excuse me. Welcome, everybody. I have got to get over here and like and share this live Bible study. I hope everyone's doing well today. I was typing in BHB Ministries and, uh, well, I thought I was, and I was typing like and share. So, uh, obviously, my head is all over the place right now. All right, like, share, share now, get on board, turn down the volume. Oh, well, I hope everybody is doing well today. I am blessed beyond measure. Um... Tell you what, big things getting ready to go down at BHB Ministries, so uh, I'm excited for that. But it is seven o'clock, and it is time to hi. <laughs> uh, it is time to pray. Hey, Ryder Dad. All right, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time where we can just. Sink ourselves into your Holy Scripture, Lord. Lord, I pray that as we, we read the words and we see the text, that we, we do not ignore the context, that we do not ignore the author's intent, that we do not ignore the, the true meaning of Scripture, Lord. Let us not ever twist it. Let us not ever bend it so that it meets our lives. Lord, let us adjust our lives according to your Holy Word, Lord. Lord, as we, we look at the life of Moses, let us see the faith that he has, Lord. Let us see the, the way that he... He, re he relates to you, Lord, the way that he communicates to you, Lord, the way that he carries out your commands and the way that he is, he is faithful, Lord. Lord, let us, let us shape our lives so that we may be faithful like Moses, Lord. But let us always, always notice that he also falls short at times. And there are times that his faith is lacking, Lord. We are like Moses. We are human. Please forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our shortcomings, Lord. Bring us together now so that we can rejoice in your holy word. Let us take these words. Let us apply them to our lives, Lord. And let us praise you the way that we should. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. All right. Um, so right now, me and Stephanie are watching. <laughs> so Stephanie. And me. And Nikki. Yeah, but you're not part of the two eyes at the top. I'm invisible. You're invisible. Oh, there's a third. I don't know who that is, though. Okay. All right. So, last week, last week we uh, we started out in Exodus, and um, what we had seen was we had seen that 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 now Israel, who was once, uh, hello, Katie. We are monitoring you. We expect you to watch the whole thing. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we saw, we see that, uh, you know, where Jacob and, and his family had come to Israel and they lived in peace and they had made uh, friends with Pharaoh. As a matter of fact, uh, if you remember correctly, uh, Jacob even blessed Pharaoh. So the relationship at, at that time, um, because of the, the work of Joseph and the work that the Lord had done through him, was a good relationship. And uh, they were given the land in Goshen. Um, and they were told to take it and to to work the land, to uh, raise their cattle, and to do uh, the things that they needed to do so that they could survive. And then we see at the end of Genesis, we saw that both Jacob and Joseph had passed away. And we fast forward some years, and we see that no longer is... Uh, is Israel in favor with Pharaoh or with, um, with the nation of Egypt? We see that they had fallen out of favor. Now, why had they had fallen out of favor? Well, we remember that the century before, um, before the Exodus, um, Egypt had really come into power, and Egypt had really spread its wings and spread their possessions throughout the land. And the thing about that is, when these nations would take over other nations, they would remain that single nation. However, leaders would rise up from different places. So they had what was called a, 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 a Hyksos king, or a king from another region that took over Egypt. And he was not familiar with Joseph. He was not familiar with um, Jacob. He was not familiar with the, the, the plight of uh 
uh, of their family. He was not familiar with the wonderful things that Joseph had done. And frankly, he didn't care. Because what he was looking at is he was looking at these Israelites who were just multiplying like rabbits. They were outnumbering the Egyptians. And he said, we need to put them under hard labor. We need to put them under our control. We need to put them under our thumb. Because if they continue to grow, they can overthrow us. And they can become the nation and there will be no more Egypt. So they were, um, they were put into hard labor. They were put into building cities. They were put into uh, making bricks. They were put into um, this, this extremely hard labor. But that was not enough because um, as we continued to read in the first three chapters, we see that it eventually got to the point where the, the king, the pharaoh, said, kill every male Egyptian or every male Israelite that is born. And that is where we get into the story of Moses, because the midwives, they were, they were told to kill the, the, the sons of Israel at birth. And the midwives, through the grace of God, they were believers in God as well. They, did, uh, they could not get to the Hebrew women fast enough to deliver these children. So they could not carry out Pharaoh's wishes. They did not desire to carry out Pharaoh's wishes. And God answered their prayers by allowing these children to be born faster. So they did not have to lie. They did not have to be deceitful. They simply went to Pharaoh and said, we can't get there fast enough. We have not done what you commanded us. We can't get there. So God honored them and blessed them with families, but eventually gave the command to all of Egypt, all of the Egyptians, and said, look, when these kids are born, if it's a man... Well, it won't be a man. It'll be a male. <laughs> Could you see that? <laughs> like a full-grown me coming out of my mom. What's up, mom? <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, that's how we get to the story of Moses is because Moses is born and his mom hid him um, as long as she could. And eventually uh, she knew that he would be discovered and he would put, be put to death. So she faithfully... Um, made him a little baby boat and put the little baby boat into the Nile. And um, Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe and she saw this beautiful child, said, decided that she wanted him. And Moses' sister is, well, would you like me to get someone to nurse him? So Moses got to be nursed by his mother. And when he was of age, he was eventually given to the daughter of Pharaoh. This is important. This is important because uh, we, we made a comparison to Paul. You know, Paul, um, after his conversion to, uh, to discipleship, to Christianity, he knew the ways of the Jews who knew, because he was a, um, a Pharisee. He also knew the Roman way because he was born Roman and he had this, the rights of a Roman citizen. Well, Moses... He was, um, he was raised in the house of Pharaoh, so he was very familiar with Egyptian society, how Egyptian society worked, how Egyptian government worked, how um, the ins and outs. But he also, um, at some point, because it does not go over his childhood, these are all things that we know from the context of Scripture. It does not go into great detail about his childhood, but we know at some point that he did become aware of his, his people. So she knew the baby Moses. And um, we have a question, but... I think... Hi, Andrew. I think maybe he's questioning the sister happened to be... His sister happened to be there. Oh, yeah. When, when, when his Moses sister is the one that put the little baby boat in the Nile, and she was uh, there to see what happened. Like I said, his mom had done this in faith and commanded... Well, not commanded, but asked his sister to to take him and put him in the Nile and to stand and watch. And so she witnessed the whole um, discovering of Moses by Pharaoh's daughter. And um, in, in a, a very smart move, she immediately asked, do you want me to find someone to nurse him? So, um, so he went back to his mother. Now, um, from the context, 
We don't know for sure if Pharaoh's daughter knew that that was Moses' mother that was nursing him, or um, we also don't know if she knew that that was uh, Moses' sister. The context just doesn't reveal that to us. Um, just like the context doesn't reveal a whole lot about Moses' childhood. However, from his actions, um, he saw an Egyptian uh, beating a, uh, a Hebrew man, um, treating him poorly, and he killed the Egyptian. Um, and then the next day there was a, uh, there was a scuffle, um, um, there was a scuffle between, uh, two Hebrew men and he went to break it up and they said, who gives it, who made you balls? And, uh, what are you going to do? You're going to kill us like the Egyptians? So Moses knew that he had to, uh, leave Egypt. Um, Pharaoh was seeking his life. The, the Hebrews, they weren't, uh, rallying behind him, uh, to say the least. Um, and you know, at that point, who can really blame them? Um, you know, here's Moses who was, who was born into slavery, who, who would have, should have been a slave, but, but he received the perks of growing up in Pharaoh's household. Um, so Moses goes and, uh, and he goes into, uh, the land of the Midianites. And we, we discussed, uh, that they were also descendants of Abraham um, he, he finds his bride there, but he also, um, is confronted with God there. And, uh, he has, uh, a, a, a siding with the, the burning bush. Um, and the Lord tells him that he is the one he has heard Israel crying out and that he is going to return Israel to the land of milk and honey, that they are going to receive the second part of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, the first part of the Abrahamic covenant was the promise of seed. And we can see that the promise of seed is obviously taking place because the Egyptians are scared to death about how fast these Hebrews are multiplying. And uh, God not only says that I'm going to return them to the land, he also says, Moses, I'm going to use you as the vessel to do that. And Moses uh, plainly asks God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? What makes me special? Why am, am I the one that you're choosing? And I want us to keep that in the back of our mind because when we opened up in prayer, one of the things that I was praying about was the faith of Moses. And the first thing that we're, we're seeing right here is we are seeing a humbleness that Moses has towards the Lord. You know, the Lord is asking him to do a mighty thing, to, to, to move Israel out of slavery, to move Israel out of the hand of Egypt. And Moses is just a man. And not only that, he's a, a man on the run who is between two sides. He's between Pharaoh's house and he's between the Hebrews, and neither one of them are very happy with him at the moment. So he is asking God, he's saying, who am I that I should be the one that does this? And, you know, and, and, and then he even asked God his name. And um, that is where we, we circled, we underlined, we put stars um, next to I am who I am. And uh, just to tell the Israelites that I am sent you. Um, that is important to remember because of the I am statements of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus Christ actually... Um, a good friend of mine, Lawson Pittman, talk a, <laughs> taught a lesson uh, a couple weeks ago on the uh, seven I am statements of Jesus Christ in which I am, um, where he presented himself, not by saying I am God, but he presented himself as being I am and he showed that he was um, over creation, he was over humanity, that he was over, that he showed that he was God through these I am statements and the Israelites who should have known these pieces of scripture, um, still ignored it, still sent him to the cross. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with God and Moses having a talk still. And, um, oh, we are starting right now. We are getting ready to start in chapter four, starting with verse one. Um, Andrew, I'm so glad that you are here and you are doing what I wish everyone would do, asking questions, because asking questions means that you have a desire to learn, and uh, that is awesome. That was just basically a recap of chapters one through three. Um, we do that each week in our Bible study, um, kind of like uh, when you're watching a television series, they show what happened on the previous episodes. <laughs> Same deal. Um, 
I like to consider myself a Tom Selleck. Um, <laughs> ruggedly handsome, good mm-hmm. facial hair. Yeah. Um, so here we are, chapter 4, verse 1. And um, God had just told Moses, he said, Not only am I going to take them out of Egypt, but when they leave... They are going to plunder the land without having to raise a hand. The Egyptians are going to be so ready for them to leave that they are going to give them their gold. They are going to give them their jewelry. They are going to give them their riches. And that they are going to give them all of these things. So, um, praise God, Andrew. Praise God. (laughs) Praise God. And um, so in verse 1, it says, Moses answered, What if they won't believe me and will not obey? Obey me, but say the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord has asked him, what is in your hand? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. And the Lord told Moses, stretch out your hand and grab it by the tail. So he stretched out his hand and he caught it. And the staff in his hand, uh, it became a staff in his hand. This will take place, he continued, so that they will believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So God is saying, Moses is saying, well, what if they don't believe me? And God's saying, well, I'm going to give you the ways to make them believe you. You you will receive a way to reach the Israelites. Now, in this case, he is doing it through wonders. We just saw him throw a staff on the ground, and we saw it become a snake. And God says, you know, in addition to that, put your hand inside your cloak. So he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, it was diseased, resembling snow. This is, this is uh, most likely, likely leprosy. And he said, uh, so, so he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand again, it became like the rest of his skin. So, so now Moses has two signs to show them. He has the, the staff to throw on the ground, which will become a snake, and then he'll grab the tail, and it'll become a staff again. And then he'll put his hand inside the cloak, and then he'll pull it out, and it'll be diseased, leprous, and he will put it back in, and he will pull it out, and it'll be healthy again. So here's two signs that, that the Lord has given Moses that he can perform to show the people. And he says, if they will not believe you and will not respond to the evidence of the first sign, they may believe the evidence of the second. And if they don't believe even these two signs, listen to what you say. Take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. So God is saying, I've picked you. I've given you the tools. You go deliver my message. Now, remember, when we look at context, we're not going to change the meaning of this because we have to look at context and we have to look at Scripture for what it is. The truth of the matter is, the Lord is giving Moses the tools to reach the Israelites who are now enslaved by Egypt. Okay, however, we can build a bridge because all Scripture is applicable to our lives today. That is why it's called the living Word of God. Now, if we were to take this and we were to build a contextual bridge over to modern day, what can we say? Stephanie, you are one of our star students. Stephanie, (laughs) what kind of bridge can we take from this piece of scripture and apply it to our lives today? I'll give you a couple of minutes. In the meantime, Nikki will sing us a song. No, she won't. I'm just kidding. Nikki's not going to sing us a song. (laughs) Stephanie, I've got I I know you can do this. I know you can do this. So let, let's just review it real quick one more time. God has said, I have chosen you to Moses. And Moses has said, What if they do not believe me? So the Lord has said, Here is this, this, and this to make them believe you. What kind of bridge can we draw between today and then? I don't know what kind of delay we got. And I did kind of put Stephanie on the spot there. Yeah, so, kill you. <laughs> Stephanie, I'm going to take you off the spot. Although I think you've probably got the answer. You're probably typing madly right now. Same thing. Boom. It is the same thing. 
God has said to you, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and remember that you didn't choose Jesus, Jesus chose you, because we are unable to choose Jesus on our own. So Jesus has chosen us, and we are the elect. We are the ones that Jesus has, has shown. And Jesus has given us a simple, simple plan, a simple, simple task. And we, we are to deliver the message of God to the people that we come in contact with. Now, what kind of tools has, has Jesus given us for that? Well, the first tool that Jesus gave us is his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. He has given us that historical evidence to present to other people. Yet, if people do not believe that first miraculous sign, exactly, evangelism, evangelism, and if they don't believe that first miraculous sign of Jesus Christ, life, death, resurrection, and ascension, which many people don't, what is the other tool that he has given us? Our testimony. Our lives. Our lives are, are miracles and wonders just like the miracles and wonders that he had given to Moses. The fact that the, 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 the homeless person who comes to know Jesus Christ and actually follows the, 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 the precepts and the, 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 the morals and the ethics and the ways of Jesus Christ, the fact that they are able to, to, to miraculously pull themselves up, get themselves into a home, provide for their families, that is not a miracle of our own doing. That is not a sign of the human spirit. That is a sign of the Holy Spirit. God has given us our testimonies in the Holy Spirit to deliver a message to the people today. So we can definitely relate to what Moses is going through. We can see that Moses has been chosen. We see that he's put before God and, and, and stood before God and, and received a commandment. And he's received a way to do it. And Moses says the same exact thing that most of us say. <laughs> He says, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the past or recently, or since you have been speaking to me, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. And the Lord said to him, who placed a mouth on humans? Mm -hmm. Who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So the Lord points to the very creation of man as a rebuke to Moses' excuse not to do it. And I say that that's the excuse because when we ask people to evangelize, that's the first thing they say. I'm not good at talking to people. <laughs> I'm not good. And, and Moses obviously had something with his speech. We, we, no, no one knows exactly what it is. He may, have had a, he may have had a lisp. He may have stuttered. Personally, I believe he stuttered because of the, the words where he says, my tongue, my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. Um, but maybe he just didn't form thoughts well in speech. Um, but you see, the Lord said, I put mouths on humans. I'm the one that makes them speak. I'm the one that makes them deaf. I'm the one that makes them blind. If I want you to do this, you will be able to do it. Your excuse, therefore, not valid. Stamped it, not valid. I woke the dog up. So... So he is rebuked right there by the Lord. And now the funny thing is, the next thing that the Lord says is, now go. We're drawing this bridge over today still. I don't care what kind of excuses you make not to evangelize. I don't care what kind of excuses you make not to serve. I, I, I don't care what kind of excuses you make not to do the things of God. Your excuses are null and void. Your excuses are not valid. If you claim Christianity, if you are claiming to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have been given the abilities to do exactly what Moses was just commanded to do, and that is now go. Mm -hmm. Now go. So um, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Again, same thing today. We see in Scripture that God tells us that when we are confronted, not to worry because he will put the proper words in our mouth to respond to doubters and to respond to those who try to deny Jesus Christ. And then Moses says the next thing that most people say. 
Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. <laughs> <laughs> so he's saying, okay, I, I know that you can, I know that you can get me through that. I know that you can make me speak. I know that you can do all this, but, but still send someone else. Send someone else. Do you think that Moses didn't want his people free? Of course he did. Do you think that Moses didn't want to see the, the, the promised land? Of course he did. But Moses wanted someone else to do the work. We talk about Moses' faith, and we're seeing the beginning of his faith. This is where everyone is at at the beginning of faith. We receive Jesus Christ, and we want that reward. We, we have already received that reward in salvation. But at the same time, we want someone else to do his will. We want to see other people do that work, and we want to reap reward. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, this is why I want us to pay attention to Moses, because this is where we need to be as a people and as a church. We need to get past the Lord send someone else and get to the okay. Mm -hmm. the, the Lord send someone else, that is a natural reaction to being asked to do something that you're not used to doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a natural reaction to coming into a whole new life. That is a natural re reaction to changing everything. However, that send someone else should wear off at some point. If you are always that send someone else person. Oh. <laughs> what were you saying yesterday about if you're going to put that fear in front of something that you're called to do? What were you saying yesterday? That was really good about uh, Oh, yeah, if you're going to if you're going to if you fear your calling, then you need to step back and you need to ask God if that is your calling. Because, um, you know, yes, it is intimidating. Yes, you know, when, when I was asked to lead a church, of course, that's intimidating. That is scary. However, the, that has to wear off and faith has to come in. You see, f faith is the defeater of fear. You know, if you fear leadership, you'll never be a leader. If you fear um, correction, then you will never be a leader. If you fear, um, if you, if you fear discipleship, you'll never be a disciple. If you fear these things and you resist these things and you say, send someone else every single time, you will never be what you want to be. And it says, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? So God's mad. Not not like I'm going to strike you down mad, but he is he is definitely frustrated with Moses. Now the the, the thing that, that we need to, to look at here is you hear so many people say, You can't deny the Holy Spirit. It's impossible to deny the Holy Spirit. It's not impossible to deny the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. Right here, Moses is trying to deny God. And he says, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. So now he's removing that excuse even more. He's saying, he's saying, okay, you don't speak good? Your brother does. And also, he's on his way to come and meet you. <laughs> <laughs> he will rejoice when he sees you. You will speak with him and tell him what to say. I will help you both, you and him, speak, and I will teach you both what to do. He will speak to the people for you. He will serve as a mouth for you, and you will serve as God to him. And take his staff, and take this staff in your hand, and you will perform the signs with it. We're going to pump the brakes right here. There's a lot, there's a lot in this chapter that we just, we've got to cover. Mm -hmm. First things first. We see the, the, the omniscience, the, the all-knowingness, and the, 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 the omnipresence of the Lord being everywhere, right here. Because he knows that, that Moses' brother is on his way, and he knows that his brother is going to rejoice in seeing him. He also knows that his brother is a good speaker. His brother is a Levite, which means um, Moses is a Levite also, which means that they are both of the priestly order. Um, so, so they are, you know, Aaron is a good speaker. He's coming. He'll be happy to see you. He'll speak for you, and you will serve as God to him. Moses is not a God. God is not saying that I am about to make you God. 
what God is saying is, I am going to speak through you, and you are going to speak to Aaron, and Aaron is going to speak to the people. So, so Moses is going to be the receiver, and Aaron is going to be the transmitter. God is the originator. God is always the originator. God is, the, God is where the message comes from. Moses is not going to become a god. Moses is not to be worshipped. Moses is not taking a place of deity. He does not have deity. He does not have um, God in him as far as being a god. He is merely the transmitter that God uses, the receiver that God uses so that God's message can be transmitted through Aaron. And it says, then Moses went back to his father-in-law Jethro and said to him, Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt and see if they are still living. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now, remember Jethro and all this. Jethro, Jethro is a good father-in-law. He truly is. Jethro, Jethro supports Moses throughout, throughout Scripture. And he also um, gives Moses some very sound advice in a little while. So um, keep him in mind. And he says, Now in Midian, the Lord told Moses, Return to Egypt, for all the men who want to kill you are dead. Again, we see the, the omniscience and the omnipresence of, 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 the, of God. So Moses took his wife and his sons, and he put them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took God's staff in his hand. The Lord instructed Moses, When you go back to Egypt, Make sure you do before Pharaoh all the wonders that I have put within your power, but I will harden his heart. So God is even telling Moses right now at this point, and this is this is big because um, this is a lot. A lot of times, well, this is where Moses' faith gets tested because Moses is going to be delivering a message that he knows is about to fall on deaf ears. Andrew's got a question about that, so he didn't fully understand, which is it's very difficult to understand. Why would God harden Pharaoh's heart here? Um, and he says, was it to show Pharaoh that God is the God Almighty? Well, it, 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 serves, as, it serves as a couple of purposes. Um, that is one of the purposes, is to show himself as God, because in a moment we will see that Pharaoh says that he does not know God. So... At the end of this uh, little journey here, Pharaoh's going to know God. Mm -hmm. um, whether he has a relationship with him, positive or negative, we'll see. But he will know God at the end of this. The other thing is um, that, that's being demonstrated here is we always have to remember that there is a, a theological purpose to all things that God does. There are lessons to be learned and there, there are traits that we are to pick up. Um, you know, we, we talk about um, receiving the things that God has in store for us and being ready to receive those things. You know, there's been a period of time that um, the Israelites have been enslaved to Egypt. And if God was to just say, all right, you're released, you know, um, first first thing that we would happen is they wouldn't know how to handle it. They wouldn't be prepared. Um, the second thing is it wouldn't be appreciated. The other thing is if, if Pharaoh's heart was not hardened, um, they would not be able to say that it was truly of God. Even though it was truly of God, some people would say, oh, well, you know, Moses did a great job talking Pharaoh into letting us leave. Or Aaron, Aaron sure is good with his words. He, uh, he duped Pharaoh, you know, so, so you know, it, it comes back to, uh, to faith and, and discipleship, you know. Are you going to continue to obey the Lord when you fail? Are you going to continue to have faith when things don't go as you want them to? Because, of course, Moses, Moses is already scared to death to go talk to Pharaoh, uh, much less more than one time. So uh, so now he knows that his heart will be hardened and he won't let the people go. And you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. Look, I'm about to kill your firstborn son. This is foreshadowing. This is 
also God showing his 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 omnipotence, his all powerfulness, as well as his omniscience, his all knowingness, and his omnipresence, because we don't know for quite a few chapters whether or not Pharaoh's firstborn is going to die. But right there, we do need to circle that because Andrew brought up a great point. Circle starting with let my son go, because he's calling Israel his firstborn son. I'm about to kill your firstborn son. When the firstborn son is killed, we know it's of the Lord. On the trip, at an overnight campsite, it happened that the Lord confronted and intended confronted him and intended to put him to death. So Zipporah took a flint, cut off her son's foreskin, and threw it at Moses' feet, and said, You are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time she said, you are a bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. So we need to go all the way back to Genesis 17. Why in the world would Moses, Zipporah uh, in particular, be forced to circumcise their son? In, verse, in chapter 17 of Genesis, and you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it because it's, it's, it's important. Remember, remember that we have to understand the context of Scripture if we are to understand what's happening. Right now, what it looks like if we don't have the context is that God was just somehow being spiteful or somehow being mean to Moses and his sons and saying, you've got to be circumcised. But that's not the case at all. That's not the case at all. Circumcision was a sign of love. Circumcision was a sign of a covenant. Circumcision was the sign of, of God's agreement with the people. Starting with verse 3, it says, Then Abram fell face down, and God spoke with him. As for me, here is my covenant with you. Remember, God is the establisher of all covenants. God is the one that it creates the covenant. God is the one that establishes the covenant. And man is the one that is supposed to honor his end of the bargain. We have always fallen short, though, and he has always shown his grace. You will become the father of many nations. We know this to be true right now. Midian is a, is a nation from Abraham. We know that uh, the Arab nations are... Are, are, are nations that are descended from Abraham because of Ishmael. And we know that Israel is a nation that is sprung from Abraham. So he's the father of many nations, just like the Lord said. He says, your name will no longer be Abram, your name will be Abraham, for I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. We see this to already be true as well. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your future offspring. So right there, we see that the future offspring of, uh, of Abraham are going to be partakers of this covenant throughout their generations. It is a permanent covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. So, so this covenant that God is making with Abraham is saying, this is permanent. This is not anything that wears off. I will always be your God. And to you and to your future offspring, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan. So, so we see now that, okay, well, leaving Egypt has a purpose. Leaving Egypt is going to be the fulfillment of that part of the covenant as a permanent possession, and I will be their God. God also said to Abraham, as for you and your offspring, after throughout their generations, are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, which you are to keep. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you is to be circumcised at eight days old. Every male born in your household or purchased from any foreigner and not your offspring. Whether born in your household or purchased, he must be circumcised. My covenant will be marked in your flesh as a permanent covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that male will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So here comes Moses. 
on his way to Egypt to take the people of Israel to fulfill the Lord's covenant, and him and his sons have not kept the Lord's covenant of circumcision. Moses could not have done what he had to do without circumcision. In order to be accepted into, let's read it again. He says, he will, will, be bro, will, will be cut off from his people. In order to not be cut off from the very people that he is trying to bring out of slavery, he had to be circumcised. Now we know that, uh, that with the, 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 the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the law of circumcision is, has been fulfilled, and that the law of circumcision is now symbolic of our hearts. And um, so circumcision is no longer on the table, but at this time, this was the sign of the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, which was the seed and the land. The seed part had been fulfilled, the land part was about to be fulfilled, and Moses, the, the one that was going to be the, the procurer, the one that took them into the promised land, he had to adhere to that covenant. It is also important to note that Moses, being raised in the Egyptian household, would not have been required to be circumcised. However, Moses, being of the tribe of, of Levi, should have had some knowledge of the law of circumcision. Now, why was his wife so angry? Well, you know, first off, she had to, she had to, you know, circumcise her kid. So, you know, that is what it is. Um, however, the other thing that we need to remember is when we go back to chapter 2, and the daughters of Jethro come, and they're speaking to him, and talk about this man that rescued them from the shepherds. In verse 19, they say, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. Moses had been, had set aside, even though he was raised in an Egyptian household, he had set aside his Hebrew heritage when he spoke to them. There's nothing that says that he had told Zipporah anything different throughout this entire scripture. So, of course, she's angry. Not only does she have to circumcise her sons, but this is a complete surprise to her. <laughs> so, um... Are you reading from English Standard? No, in this one I'm reading from Christian Standard. CSB. We try to do the Bible studies with English Standard or Christian Standard. I've been using Christian Standard because it is a lot easier to understand and grasp than thou King James. <laughs> now, um, here at the end, um, we see again, we see God's providence. Um, this is something that I spoke about yesterday at the beginning of service. You know, when God wants people to connect and when God wants to bring people together, God has a way of doing it. Um, I used the example yesterday of the wedding that I was blessed to officiate and the fact that I was reunited with a friend of mine from over 25 years ago who um, had been in a car accident and had been paralyzed uh, for the rest of his life. But he also has a very um, powerful ministry in Knoxville. And... Um, there is no way that that was anything but God's providence. There was no way that that was anything but God's will. And we see that, that you know, Moses and Aaron reuniting, this is obviously not a, a planned reunion on the part of Moses. Um, because uh, the Lord is the one that tells him that Aaron is on his way to him. The Lord tells him that uh, Aaron is the one uh, that will rejoice when he sees him. Um, he, 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 he tells him all these things. And then it gets down here to verse 27, and it says, Now the Lord had said to Aaron, Go and meet Moses in the wilderness. So we see that the Lord had commanded Aaron to go. We see that this was not initially Aaron's plan. Aaron did not wake up and say, Man, you know what? Today would be a good day to go reunite with my brother, who I have not seen in ages. I wonder how he is doing. So... 
So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses told Aaron everything that the Lord had, had sent him to say and about all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled the elders of the Israelites. Aaron repeated everything the Lord had said to Moses and performed the signs before the people. So we see that the Lord had kept his promise. He delivered Aaron over to Moses, and Moses is the one that transmitted, the one that received the word from God. He gave it to Aaron, and Aaron is the one that transmitted it to the people. So Aaron spoke to the Israelites, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had, had paid attention to them and that he had seen their misery, they knelt low and worshipped. Mm -hmm. This is very similar to when... It's similar, yet it's different. The ways that it's similar is Jacob left a place of, of polytheism, the worshipping of many gods, um, and went out, and God spoke to him, and he realized that God was with him when he had always thought God to be stationary, be in the form of a image or in the form of a statue or whatever it may be. These are people that should have knowledge of Joseph. They should have knowledge of what God had done for them. They should have knowledge of Abraham. They should have knowledge of Adam and Eve. They should have all this knowledge um, of all the people that came before them. Um, however, when you get into those situations, when you get into that place of misery, because that's where they were as a nation, a lot of times what happens when we get so sunk into our misery is we forget that God is with us. We forget that God is looking after us. And we forget to seek God. It never says that they specifically cried out to God. It never says that Israel as a whole cried out and said, God, come and help us. It says that the Lord heard their groanings and responded accordingly. So this is the first sign to the people of Israel. Hey, I haven't forgotten about you. I love you. You are my people. And I am going to set you free. We can build that contextual bridge one more time. And we can look at our own lives. And we can look at the times where we get stuck in the, the muck and the mire and the, 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 the craziness of our own head, the craziness of our own lives whether it be you know, a financial situation, whether it be a situation in a relationship, whether it be um, something as simple as car trouble. You know, it's so easy for us to, to forget God and try to, try to handle it ourselves or, or try to just, or, or we'll just sink even deeper into it and be like, nobody loves me. Ooh. And, and you know, we get into that state um, where if we, we take a step back and we look at all the things that God has already done for us, of course God is going to respond to our cry for help. And um, so, so, you know, we can take that with us as we close out this, 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 this chapter, is, that, um, <laughs> is that, that the people finally realize, the people come to the realization that God is there and God loves them. So just a, a quick recap of today. Um, Moses is called. Moses tries to get out of what he has to do. Moses makes excuses. God rebukes Moses' excuses and says, go. I'm giving you the tools. You're going to go. Moses resists again. God gives him another tool and his brother Aaron. Moses finally relinquishes control and does what the Lord wants him to do. And when they go and they do what the Lord wants them to do, they are successful. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of lesson in one chapter. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I pray and, and I hope that, um, that we as, as, as a people... We as, as a, a, a church, an individual church and a church body, 
you know, because not everyone who listens to this is 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 at by his blood ministries. And if you're not, God bless you. I pray that you're going to church somewhere. But what we need to learn is we need to learn that if we follow the commands of God, if we follow the path that he puts us on, that there is victory and that there is um, there is a way to even do the things that we think are impossible if God puts them before us. We see it every day. Our lives are full of little bitty miracles just stacked up on each other and we're sitting there waiting for the big one while we're watching the small ones mm -hmm. and, and disregarding them. Um, so with that, I open up the floor um, to uh, questions, complaints, or concerns. <laughs> Andrew has been very vocal here. That's been pretty cool. I'm glad you've been uh, watching here today, Andrew. Uh, our sir, uh, We'll have the next Bible study next Monday, 7 o'clock. That's Eastern time. I don't know where you're at. Eastern Standard. And if you're here local, please come visit us at church. We have a service uh, Wednesday at 6 o'clock. We serve food, and service starts at 7 um, Sunday, we have a 10 o'clock service. 10.30. We have a 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock is a light breakfast. <laughs> and then we start service at 10.30. Hey, Linda. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we've all fallen. We've all fallen. We've all fallen. Yes, Andrew. I don't know if you, you know anything about me, but uh, I was 22 years a pill and heroin addict. So uh, I'm very familiar with falling. I'm very familiar with uh, letting people down. I'm very familiar with hurting people. Um, I'm very familiar uh, with the legal system. Um, I'm also very familiar with God's grace. And uh, I tell you what, Stephanie uh, just said, took the words right out of my mouth. Andrew, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for your success. And we're going to pray that, uh, that God just works on you and lays his mighty hands upon you. And uh, the wonderful things um, that he has in store for you come to fruition. Because uh, falling down leads to a testimony. And, uh, and I'm sure that you have a wonderful testimony that can touch a lot of people's lives. Um, so if we don't have any questions, I haven't seen any complaints. I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> um, we'll close out in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we thank you for this time that we're able to share together each and every week, Lord. Lord, we look forward to reading your holy word. Lord, we look forward to getting to know you better. We look forward to, to learning how to be better disciples. Lord, as we prayed earlier, let us have faith like Moses, but let us understand that faith is built. Faith is built through an understanding of who you are, what you are, and, and how, how you truly love us, Lord. Lord, let our faith continue to grow each and every day. Let us understand that, that you are with us through the good and through the bad, and that the things that you have put before us are, are things that we are very capable of, Lord. You would never give us a job without giving us the tools to complete it. Let us pay attention to the things that you have given us. Let us pay attention to the things that you have put before us. And let us see how to put those things together so that we can be victorious in the message that you want us to deliver. And we can be victorious in the, the duties that you have assigned, Lord. Lord, those that are called to evangelize, let, the, let, let them evangelize. Because that is each and every one of us. Ha! Each and every one of us are called to share your holy word. Let us do that, Lord. Those that have special callings within the church, Lord, let each and every one of them fulfill those because that is every single one of us, Lord. And allow us to understand what those callings are. Allow us to, to reach the, the capabilities that you have put, given us the potential to reach, Lord. Let us not sit back. Let us not be lazy. Let us not be, be, be comfortable. Let us move forward, just like Moses did. Let us move forward in our uncomfortableness, Lord. Let us move forward uncomfortably knowing that you will put us where we need to be, Lord. Lord, let us take that next step. Let us always seek you. Let us always understand that you have better things ahead. And let us always understand that the things that you have asked us to do are out of love and the blessings that we receive are out of grace. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. amen. Can I get an amen from Craig Whitehead? <laughs> Craig Whitehead. Amen. And you want to uh, message Andrew. He's asking for a message, if you'd message him. Message him.
I will. I love you all. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you soon. No amens. There's Stephanie, Stephanie. amen. <laughs> I don't know if Craig's still on or not. Yeah, he was just on. Craig's on. Amen, Craig. Bye, y'all. Love, Love y'all. Y'all have a wonderful week. God bless you.